on the upright bass. I'm Jake Blunt. Thanks for having us. stretches back over 300 years to the late 1600s. We're so excited to be bringing this stuff back out and sharing it with you. It's always special to bring it to a new town for the first time, and we hope you enjoy it. All these songs uh, come out of a need to grapple with difficult times and envision better futures, and we hope that they'll help you perform that task over the course of this evening and that you can bring those visions of a better future to your lives outside of this space. Us all. Now look at us, my wicked brothers, we think we're doing mighty well, but when we come to find out we done made up a bed in hell, love the down road is crowded, 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 love believe it's so, crowded, crowded, Thank you. 
like disco? Do you do much disco here in the loft? We have disco. Disco about dying painfully. Because folk music is what it is. Sister Rosetta Tharp out there. Yeah. We got a couple, couple well placed up here. There's a wonderful book about her you can read called Shout, Sister Shout by Gail F. Wald that I learned a lot about Sister Rosetta from. 
Sister Rosetta Tharp was born in Cotton Plant, Arkansas, as part of the musically progressive Kojic Church denomination, which was progressive in the sense that they allowed instruments to be played during the services. The goalposts have moved significantly in the intervening decades. But, uh, Sister Rosetta's mother, Katie Bell Newbin, was a preacher herself, a prophetess, and when Sister Rosetta was just a child, Katie decided to move both of them up to Chicago so that she could pursue her calling and maybe make some more opportunities for Rosetta in the process. Rosetta became known all across Chicago as this small child with a blazing smile and a guitar playing Pentecostal hymns, and you can still go to the church that they attended when she was just a small girl. The black community there built it brick by brick, floor by floor over decades as they have raised the funds and found the time, because they wanted a building of their own that nobody had ever had before them and no one would ever have after. And when they put that second floor on, put the balcony in their sanctuary, Mahalia Jackson came and sat there and listened to the Pentecostals sing. Well, Sister Rosetta eventually moved to Miami after marrying a guy who turned out not to be worth the trip. But while she was there, she made quite a name for herself all across the city. People came from all over Miami, people who were not part of that congregation, people who were not part of that denomination, people who were Jewish, came to church to listen to Sister Rosetta Tharp play these songs and rained money down on the stage during the services because they loved her music so much. You are free to engage in historical reenactment if you so choose. Eventually, Sister Rosetta upgraded her life in all kinds of ways, left that man behind and went up to New York City and got picked up by a place called the Cotton Club. Anybody know about the Cotton Club? Yeah. It was a real weird place and launched a lot of historic and noteworthy careers, but had the strange trait of being a venue that specialized in black music where black people could not go to listen to said music. Uh, nonetheless, many of our late greats found their beginnings there, Sister Rosetta Tharp among them, and she eventually became a worldwide sensation. She traveled all over the world playing these Pentecostal hymns on the electric guitar in nightclubs, which was about as controversial as you would expect, all the more so because she was on tour with her lover, Marie Knight, and that queer black woman invented rock and roll. This is one of our favorite songs of hers. It's called Didn't It Rain. Didn't it? Yes, didn't it? You know, didn't, didn't it? Whoa, my Lord, didn't it rain? Well, it rained for the days, it rained for the night. There was no land nowhere in sight. God sent the raven to spread the news. Hoist his wings and away he flew to the east, to the west, north, to the south. All day, all night, how it rained, how it rained. Oh, tell me, didn't it? Rain, oh my lord, didn't it? Yes, didn't it? You know it did, didn't it? Whoa, my lord, didn't it rain? Knock at the window, knock at the door. Crying, brother, can't you take a couple more? The brother said, well, your water looks living. If you can't pay, you better learn to swim. Water rising, water rising, water rising. Keep rising all day long, keep rising all night long. Tell me, didn't it rain, 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 children? Rain, oh my lord, didn't it? Yes, didn't it? You know it did, didn't it? Whoa, my lord, didn't it rain? everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Nelson Williams. Tell me, didn't it rain, 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 oh my lord, didn't it, yes, didn't it, you know, it did, didn't it, whoa, my lord, didn't it rain, tell me, didn't it rain, Hello, San Diego. How you guys doing out there? Ooh, nice. um, so this is where I just do the public service announcement. Public service now. Public service announcement. <laughs> Got so I did some calculations over the last two weeks. I recently just moved back to my homeland, which is Louisiana, particularly New Orleans. Right. Um, amongst that and this turn tour, I have driven over 300 to sorry 3,264 miles over the last two weeks which is enough miles that I could have driven from California to England. Um, <laughs> but that's just an excuse because I can't talk tonight. But anyway, firstly, we play string band music, which means that tuning is just a part of what we do. Um, it used to be that you would just have to listen to <laughs> that for X amount of minutes, and me stalling with historical facts just became a much funner way of spending the time. Um, so Greco-Roman society, civilization, that's my specialty. Um, and there's many reasons for that. And one of my favorites is that almost all of that information we get from them is from historians who are all by themselves also removed from their subject matter by sometimes hundreds of years. But then also they are our best sources because like their sources don't exist anymore. So you know, you go with what you get. Um, my particular favorite one is named Cenotonus. Uh, his book is called The Twelve Caesars. Um, great book. It's, it's called The Twelve Caesars, but I want to make sure you guys know it's not the Twelve Emperors because Julius Caesar was not an emperor. He was at best a dictator. That is my trivia for you. If someone says, hey, Julius Caesar, the emperor, they're absolutely wrong and you should shame them about it. <laughs> but with Cenotonus, what I love about his history is that they're factual about, you know, things that happened in his life. They follow certain battles, you know, important key points. But the best part is that he's a gossip. He reads like the most gossipy bitch you have ever seen. <laughs> and it's great, because, you know, the same guy who's out here praising Tiberius for like, quelling a rebellion in Illyria is also just like, yeah, you know, at one point he just left Rome for a couple years, went to the island of Capri with a bunch of young men, and, you know, he hung out there until conspiracy made him come back and do his job. And you know, you can't make that up. That's just history. It's just history. Nelson Williams.
one from Fannie Lou Hamer.
some of you heard this like a few minutes ago, but uh, we're gonna do one new for you. This is called Once There Was No Sun. I learned it from Bessie Jones and the Georgia Sea Island Singers.
another song from Virginia. Are there any Virginians out there tonight? Yeah? One? Hey. Where are you from? Charlottesville. Okay. Well, this one's from State Penitentiary. I'll let you guess what it is they do there. My family's from Smithfield. Any fans of a Smithfield ham or other Smithfield pork products? One. I can't tell if San Diego's a ham town. I haven't been here long enough. You never know in California if it's a ham town or not. This one was recorded back in the 1920s from a guy named Joe Lee. And as far as I know, Joe and one other person in Danville, Virginia, were the only two people to record it back then, and I'm the only person to have recorded it recently. Um, I found the song, spent three days holed up in my office trying to figure out what to do with it, and uh, wound up playing all the parts except the bass and sending it off to my friend, who's a bass player, to play the bass and to mix it, and then send it off to the label, and yada yada. It is now my top stream song, has been the whole time. Spotify picked it as one of the best blues songs of 2022. They probably paid me $4 for it. And uh, we had this very surreal experience of going to play this festival in Denmark called Rosnilda, um, which is like Danish Coachella. Like the headliners were Lil Nas X, Lizzo, and Kendrick Lamar. And then there was us. Very strange. I don't know how they heard about us, but we had a good time. And um, the surreal experience was putting on the beat for this song that, again, people here haven't even heard, right? There's, I'm the only modern recording of this song. And all these, like, six-foot-tall, blonde Danish people lost their minds and sang every word with us. And uh, it's really nice to know that this uh, attempt at resurrection is succeeding in some way, shape, or form, uh, even if in Denmark. I don't know why it resonates so much, but I'm glad it does. I'd like to donate this one to Elon Musk.
Nelson Williams back there on the bass, everybody. Well, this song comes from one of my favorite recordings of a man named Cutie Ledbetter, better known as Lead Belly. And uh, it's this old WNYC broadcast that you can find online. It's, it's pretty stellar. And uh, my favorite song from that is not actually the one we're about to play for you. It's one where it's just Lead Belly and his guitar, and he's just testifying for like five minutes about flapjacks. He's just like, you're gonna get up into heaven, and you're gonna find a big stream of lasses, and it's gonna be a big pile of flapjacks on either side. And you're gonna get those flapjacks, you're gonna take a big old knife, you're gonna drag it through the butter, you're gonna drag the butter through the flapjacks, and you're gonna put the molasses on the flapjacks, and then you go, you go find a big stream of honey. You're gonna put the honey on the, on the flapjacks, you're gonna put the honey and the molasses on the flapjacks, you're gonna eat your flapjacks. And I'm like, yes, brother. Church, preach, tabernacle. Flapjacks for all. If y'all do flapjacks at the loft, I need to get mine. Well, this other song that we're about to perform for you uh, comes from Singing of Hand Peoples. Or not Hand Peoples, what am I talking about? It's going to come to me when the song is over. Anne Graham. There she is. Anne Graham. Uh, who I spent a little bit of time looking into to try and figure out where she was from, what she did, who she was. Found only a little bit. Uh, other than this one performance that she did with Lead Belly, there's not very much out there about her. We know that she sang some really great old spirituals. She composed her own music. They play a couple of her songs on that broadcast, but this is an old one that she sang as well. Thank you. 
talk earlier, but there's a lot more of us now. I want to share some of that. We all come out of this community, the old time string band community, where we spend a lot of time listening to old recordings of dead people we've never met, and that's where we learn most of our music. It's a very strange and antisocial way to learn music for people who like to hang and jam so much, but it's what we do. And it struck me at a certain point how strange it is that we've accepted it as authentic historic practice to learn music from electromechanical replicas of dead people. And yet we have not taken the logical next step of reaching forward through that same machine to the people who have not yet been born. Because I know it's meaningful for me to go back and listen to all these old songs to hear how the folks who came before me thought. And to take some solace in the fact that back then the world was on fire too, because it's looking pretty grim out there, I have to say. And uh, I think it's important when you listen to all this stuff to remember, yes, these are people who are grappling with the toughest of times who had no reason to believe that their children's lives would be any better than their own. These are folks who couldn't imagine me being free, much less up here singing this song for an appreciative audience for plenty of money. And I appreciate that. <laughs> I like to say we are our ancestors' wildest dreams, and I have to say, what are our dreams? Because the world is a mess, and if there's one thing you can say from looking at all these old songs is that people back then understood it was their moral obligation to set their progeny up for success, to create a better world to pass on than what they have inherited. And I have to wonder, are we even going to pass on anything inhabitable? Are we going to pass on anything anyone would ever want to live on? Because it's already feeling like we're nearing the tipping point of why would I be here? I don't know, we have a lot of issues to solve, and I hope that as much as we can enjoy the groove, as much as we can enjoy the trance, as much as we can enjoy the deliverance of these old songs, we also leave here tonight understanding the urgency of fighting for reproductive justice, of fighting for trans rights, of fighting for equality between races, of fighting for a ceasefire in Gaza where there is no longer a functioning hospital. The world is full of terrible things, and it's our job to make it all better. Democracy does not just mean we have elections, it means that we are in charge, and it's time to take the reins back because the world is on fire. Oh, sinners, what you gonna do when the world's on fire? Again, Greco Roman, Greco Roman world, beautiful, beautiful place, crazy place. Um, I like to say I spend a lot of my time pondering, like, what's the purpose of history? Why do we continue studying all these old documents? Why do we compile things? Why do people still write books about this, even though we're talking about things that people have obviously talked about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times over? Um, that's, again, a very funny thing to say to a person who's about to spend a lot of their life uh, reading a bunch of th things people have done over and over again to become a doctor. No offense, Jake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was talking to someone at last night's show, um, particularly about the Greco-Roman world, and there's just something some people might find depressing. I find it beautiful that there's bits and sparks of humanity that seems to be dropped in so many different eras of life, no matter like how far removed you are, which in case for Greco-Roman stuff is like almost two to three millennia. Um, there's parts of that art, parts of that literature that still connects with like even the very different lives we all live today. Um, I remember I was in class once, we were reading the Aeneid um, which the need is nothing more than a fan fiction written by Virgil. Fight, fight me about it. Um, <laughs> truly, truly, truly it is. Um, it is just the Odyssey and the Iliad put together, not written as well as a glory project to Augustus. Again, fight me about it. 
But within it, um, one of my favorite parts um, is chapter four. Um, it's Dido and Aeneas, and particularly classes, we call this the cave scene. Um, if you are familiar with it, Dido like basically takes Aeneas, who is sad, broke, and like about to basically die, says, wow, how about I take care of you and then say, hey, I'm in control of arguably the most important kingdom in the Western Mediterranean. <laughs> this is all yours if you want to hang, which is a good deal. And he, in some ways or another, agrees to it and then says, actually, no, I want to go out and do my own thing. I have to do X, Y, and Z, and you're just not a part of that. Yeah. Which people still break up in very similar ways. Like, I got to do my thing. You have to do your thing. My thing isn't your thing. But you promised me this. Well, did I really say that? Was this actually a relationship? This is more of a situation when you really think about it. And again, the cycle kind of continues. And I think that's some of the beauty of so much old literature and things is that, you know, even back then, we were still figuring out, man, what are we? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Nelson, everybody. I will never be that because I will not sell my soul to higher academia. <laughs> no offense, you university. you me soulless? <laughs> You're fired. Uh, okay. That's the, the fifth time I fired Nelson. And yet, I'm always back.
you so much, everybody. It's Augustus Trich, Nelson Williams, I'm Jake Blunt. Thank you so much for being here. There's an old fiddle tune going to end where we began. This is one that I learned from a recording of a guy named Jimmy Driftwood who grew up in western Arkansas and learned this from two indigenous musicians who, based on some context clues he gave us, were probably Cherokee. It's called We're Gonna Hunt the Buffalo. everybody. Augustus Stritch, Nelson Williams, and Jake Blunt. Thanks so much to everyone on the sound crew. Thanks so much to everyone here at UCSD in the loft. We really appreciate it. Thanks for sharing the last night of our tour with us.